That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trade Talk, and this week we are finishing off Batman No Man's Land. This concludes the epic run that was Batman Cataclysm, Road to No Man's Land, and No Man's Land. And I really, like, Cataclysm gets billed as a different thing. I really feel like No Man's Land is so directly tied to Cataclysm more than anything else. They mention Contagion, but it's it's not even a factor in No Man's Land to, to any degree that Cataclysm is. So I kind of loop those all together in one, but maybe that's just me. Um, so yeah, this concludes No Man's Land, though, and I really, really like this volume. This probably has some of the best stuff in No Man's Land in it, um, but the interesting thing is a lot of this doesn't work without the rest of No Man's Land, and that includes Volume 3, which I said probably had the most skippable stuff in it. Um, and, you know, that's that's fine. It's it's just one of those things, stuff changes. Uh, the, this opens up with the Leslie Tompkins story, where we're kind of seeing what No Man's Land is becoming, wherein she's trying to run this, this clinic and keep peace, but she's got different factions being made. The criminal, the... the um, strong men who are the offshoot of the GCPD Blue Boys or Batman kind of all fighting for control within it and it's just it's just chaos and it's it's frightening and it's a really it's a really good mood setter for the rest of the um the arc or the the rest of the um trade and so I really appreciate it for that. It also it also starts to show a divide growing between Huntress and Pettit um, that I think is really interesting because in the first volume, Huntress uh, adopted the Batman um, symbol and, and look and everything to help um, solidify control in the early days of No Man's Land. Um, but once Batman came back and she couldn't, she couldn't um, hold up to his standards. He told her to give up the costume and, and quit trying to be a bat and, you know, just give in. Um, and then, you know, she goes from being, like, abandoned by him to um, working with Pettit uh, once he left GCPD. And so they kind of form this alliance on this, yeah, we're willing to go to extremes that, that the others aren't. And so that's just like a really, that's an, an interesting place to start her character growth, um, wherein she's never been able to live up to Batman's standards, to her deciding not to live up to Batman's standards and kind of go her own way. And then this gets to conclude that um, in a really interesting way. So we get the beginnings of this schism developing between her and Pettit in this story. Uh, and we also get some stuff with uh, Bruce Wayne that's really interesting. Then the the second uh, arc, which is by far my favorite thing in this volume, is Jurisprudence, which is just a two-part story. There's a third like part to it that's more just about Batman and, and Gordon. But Jurisprudence, for my money is the best Two-Face story ever. Um, so early in No Man's Land, Gordon makes a deal with Dent, kind of like a mutual protection thing with, with Two-Face. Um, and that kind of blows up in his face when he tries to break off that deal. Um, and it gets Renee Montoya kidnapped. And so this kind of we begin to see the consequences of, wherein Dent goes kind of crazy and he has Rene Montoya wear a dep deputy uniform and he kidnaps Jim Gordon and decides that they're going to have a trial of Jim Gordon for breaking the law and abandoning um, his post and, and all these other things. Uh, and so the second issue is the trial. And it's, it's so good to see just Two-Face 
like throw all the things Jim Gordon's done wrong right in front of uh, Jim's face in the entire um, in the entire story. And I really like the way this uh, this works out because he he frames it up as a real trial, which is really funny. So he tells Gordon that he can object at any time that he wants, and he's like. Uh, Detective Montoya, could you describe your relationship with James Gordon? Oh, for crying out, answer the question! He's my boss. My boss? Friend? Objection! Friend, he's my good call, Jimmy. Flips the coin, comes up guard side, overruled. I'll ask again. And it's just like, you get a real sense of the drama. And I really like what they start to do in this, wherein you just get like a page of the the character with the um questions going with with the um the dialogue of the questions q mr h dent please tell the court what the defendant asked you to do on day 190 of no man's land a detective third r montoya damn it harvey you know answer the question detective montoya he told me to talk to you like i, I really like this back and forth it creates a really rapid pace which helps intensify the scene, and, and you just feel the tension there. It's really, really good. Um, and then the next page, Jim Gordon gets put on the stand, and he has to go through the same thing. Um, I'm going to warn you at the outset that you are under oath. I know how to give testimony, you sanctimonious. Are you acquainted with the criminal known as Two-Face? Looking right at him. How long have you known him? Answer, please. As Two-Face, I've known him almost nine years. Could you list for the court the number of times he's been taken into custody and for what crimes? And so it goes back and forth and back and forth like that. It's just really, really cool. Um, and then the the really, really uh, best part about this for me is that uh, Two-Face decides, okay, he, he charges Gordon with, with this crime, um... And says the prosecution rests. And then he holds up the coin and says, I don't think we need this to determine the verdict, do we? Guilty. Sentence to be carried out immediately. No, wait. What about his defense? He's entitled to defense. No defense. No one to speak for him. I'll speak in my own defense. You? I don't think so, Jimmy. You're not a lawyer. I'd have to declare a mistrial. Then I'll defend him. Same problem, detective. You can't do this, Harvey. You told me you loved the law. You can't pervert it like this. No one can speak for him, Renee. Don't you understand? You can. I love this. Gordon says, you can. Looks right at Two-Face. It's like, I want Harvey Dent to defend me. Dent. For the defense. You have to, Harvey. You're the only one who can defend him. And you just get the coin... And you get the sequence of the coin flip, and the catch, and the look. I love this pa This whole page is gorgeous. And points the gun right at his face. Commissioner, you may step down. The defense calls its first and only witness. Two-Face. I love this, this panel of justice. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Um, and then they bring back the deposition trick. That was the word I was looking for. They bring back the deposition, and they have it split right down the middle. And Harvey Dent questions Two Face on the stand, and it is one of the most kooky comic booky things ever, and it's brilliant, and I love it. Um, this is one of those things we'll probably never in a million years get in a a movie. It is one of the most fundamentally you could really only get away with this in a comic because it's just a little too goofy for film or television. Uh, maybe, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I doubt the DCEU would try something like this. But the idea of putting Harvey Dent, who has this split personality, on the stand to question Two-Face is really cool. And I love the dialogue, because it, it really does feel like two separate characters in this deposition. Mr. H. Dent, did you, Two-Face, you miserable, self-righteous, arrogant, pompous, so I'll have to ask... Or what? You'll do what, you worthless? Permission to treat the, uh, as a hostile witness, Your Honor. And who do you think you're talking to, you stupid? 
Thank you. Two-Face, did you approach James Gordon on day 124 of the Federal No Man's Land? Don't you remember you were there? Did you offer him anything in exchange for your help? We entered into an agreement and you know it. Were terms set? No, no terms were. What happened next? Oh, you remember, don't you? We killed. We laid out the bodies of the Zosha and the Wreckers and let the Blue Boys just... Did Gordon ask for your help? What? Of course not. He's a wimp like you. Another... As a result of the murders you committed, the GCPD gained significant territory. You know it. In essence, you blackmailed Gordon, the implication herein being that the murders were committed at his request. Right. But they weren't. You took it upon yourself to, let's see if I can remember how you put it, serve justice. No. So any contract Gordon entered into with you was under duress and therefore void. No, 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 he did it. He's guilty and you can't, you can't, you can't. And then we're just left with, with Two-Face. Oh, I love that scene so much. Again, No Man's Land is the first, like, you know, proper weekly kind of comic event I ever read, even though it was in retrospect. And, you know, I read Dark Knight Returns. I read Killing Joke. Nothing like this happened in them. Nothing this out there yet simultaneously brilliant happened in any of the big, serious, important books that people talk about. There's no moment like this that's just wacky but super satisfying in Watchmen. Um, and so I really, really, really love this scene. And to my, for my money, this is one of, if not the very best Two-Face story. Uh, I adore this scene, and it's disappointing that there aren't more good Two-Face stories. Where he's actually Two-Face. A lot of good Two-Face stuff is his origin. Um, and then, uh, while the trial was going on, Batman saved a bunch of the hostages that, uh, Harvey took. And so, even though Gordon had been, um, feuding with Batman and not wanting to resume their partnership, uh, throughout the entirety of No Man's Land to this point, because Batman ran away at the beginning of No Man's Land, here he... Um, he finally decides to sit down and have a talk with them. And it's just a lot of, like, silent, awkward panels for a while. And then it's, like, really roundabout conversation about the way, um, Jim's been growing a garden. Uh... And then it's just this conversation about what is the nature of Batman and Gordon's relationship. And it's kind of funny uh, to read out of context because it's very erotic. <laughs> I don't have many friends. I don't have many people I trust. But I trusted you. I trusted you. You saved my wife and protected my people. I'm grateful for that. Don't think that I'm not. But that's not enough. You say you're my friend, but I don't think you have friends. <sighs> Maybe you were laughing at me too. No. Really? You use me. You've been using me for ten years. Or vice versa. Absolutely. Because I thought we wanted the same thing. I thought we wanted our city, this city, to be safe. That's what I thought. I thought we were in this together. Where the hell were you? That's why I don't believe we're friends. You don't respect me. You don't trust me. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you have your secrets. I've never pressed you for them. Maybe I should have. Instead of letting you turn me into your, your, whatever it is you see me as, you are my partner. Don't blow smoke at me. It's true. It's what you'd like to think. That doesn't make it true. Partners are equals, Batman. When have you ever treated me like you're equal? Partners, for example, tell you their plans. They keep you informed. And they sure as hell don't walk out on you in the middle of a sentence. I've never been good at saying goodbye. <laughs> Just the romantic subtext is so strong. They're totally fucking. <laughs> um, but like in all seriousness, this this notion of this like betrayed friendship and and the repairing of the friendship is really interesting. Um, 
and I really like that Batman's solution to this and, and Gordon's decision on it. Um, there's no man or woman living that I respect more than you. But like you said, saying it isn't enough. The words don't mean anything. They don't fix the damage. Actions speak louder than words. It says as he begins to remove the cowl. And Gordon turns around to, to not see the true person under the mask, to not know that Batman is Bruce Wayne. And he refuses to turn and look. Um, and they agree to uh, resume their partnership. Um, that was pretty good. I like that. I like that issue quite a bit. Uh, then the next big arc is a Catwoman story with Azrael involved. Again, I have a lot of complaints about the way this is collected. Uh, there are two major collection problems. The uh, Pilgrim's Return story um, that, that also ties in with the Catwoman story. This is about Azrael waiting for Catwoman to re-enter No Man's Land and to help her get the disc that she stole in New York to Batman in an earlier volume. So, like, when Catwoman enters the story in this, she's already on her way to and nearly in Gotham. And then, by the end of the story, she's gotten the disc to Batman and is in Gotham. Um, but then, the next story, it's called The Rules, shows how she got from getting shot in the last volume to Gotham and getting into Gotham. It's just like the Azrael story should clearly be in the middle of all this. Why is it before it? It's so oddly collected. To be fair, there's a lot of pages of just straight repeat. Like in the rules story, they credit um, Denny O'Neill for writing the scenes from Azrael. But still, like just the, the Azrael story would make so much more sense sandwiched in between these issues of Catwoman as opposed to before the entire issue uh or before the issue it, it or not sandwiched between it should have been bef uh after the issue with Catwoman. um then we get the sense of what joker's up to oh no 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 this should have been sandwiched between um we get the sense of what joker's up to and batman trying to get these discs and yada 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 uh it's weird to see harley quinn in comics because they can be a lot more violent here, and it's not as cartoonil, cartoonishly funny, so Joker beating her is a lot more jarring to see. Um, you know, when it, when you see her, like, get slapped around in the cartoon, there's a level of, of slapstick or, or, like, Looney Tunes to it. In the comic, it just it looks like domestic abuse. Um, we, give, we begin to see the, the machinations, what, you know, Bane was in the previous volume, and... And we were wondering what he was up to. The big reveal for who Bane was working for is Lex Luthor, who is trying to essentially rebuild and buy Gotham. Get it back on its feet and the No Man's Land, all that stuff. Um, there's a story with Nightwing uh, about Pettit and his men and Huntress breaking into Oracle's watchtower. And this kind of serves to some extent to, um, to increase... Or, or advance Huntress's story, but it's it's more or less forgettable. Uh, the art in the Nightwing book, though, is just hideous. Uh, there's there's no other way around it. This is just awful to look at. Just everything about it is really ugly. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I I really hate the art in the Nightwing book. Um, but anyway, Huntress kind of betrays Pettit a little bit uh, to save Nightwing and Oracle. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. We do some a flashback issue that's kind of about what Bruce Wayne was up to before he uh, came back to No Man's Land, came back to Gotham, uh, but after the No Man's Land was declared, and we get some insight into what made Huntress start putting on the the Batgirl costume. Uh, we get this cool panel of her before she stitch up the face, which is neat. Uh, Talia al Ghul shows up in the flashback. That was cool. 
Um, oh, and I also really like this uh, shout out to Batman Year One we got uh, just in the art. That's a really nice touch artistically uh, that he's kind of wearing a really similar outfit to what he wore in, uh, when he was street walking in Year One. Um, we we get an insight here as to why Batman let her even though Batman's been shown not to trust Huntress, why he let Huntress um, take on the, the symbol. Which is cool. Then we get back to uh, the LexCorp story as Lex tries to rebuild Gotham and, and really kind of starts to sway public opinion doing so. Uh, let me just say, Rucka writes a really good Lex Luthor, he writes a really good Batman, and he writes a really good Joker. Uh, I really appreciate that about Greg Rucka. He really starts showing some uh, some great chops here. Um, it's also when Mercy was in the comics. Mercy and Harley Quinn got to be in the comics at the same time. Mercy didn't stick. I don't know why. I love Mercy. Um, some stuff about... Uh, like, Lex trying to commit fraud, basically. It's nothing too big. Um, hmm. what else goes on in this as the, the whole situation oh Joker I love this scene Joker starts busting up a lot of Lex's rebuilding sites um, and trying to get attention and then one <laughs> I love this moment where he thinks he's finally drawn out Batman and I just love the dialogue Finally, I was beginning to think you didn't love me any more. Oh, this is going to suck. You just get Bane lifting him up. And it's really cool because we got this. This is the back cover, um, which I imagine was probably the cover for that exact issue where Bane came around to discourage the Joker from disrupting LexCorp property. I love parody covers, and this is a really cool one. So yeah, Bane kicks the shit out of Joker, which is always fun. I always love seeing Joker get the shit kicked out of him. Um, Batman tells Bane that he needs to get out of Gotham while he's still got to deal with Luther. Uh, public opinion begins to sway in Gotham's favor as the public decides that No Man's Land is a bad idea. And they begin getting people... Um, getting people together to to try to bring it back uh but the last big holdout of crime is joker who has claimed some territory for himself and he is the last force to be reckoned with because he does not want the no man's land to end uh he likes the anarchy he likes the chaos uh penguin also tries to extort lex luther via catwoman which is it leads to some fun stuff. I don't love the the take this writer for Catwoman has as to what exactly he's having her do, you know, scene to scene. Uh, who is it? John Ostrander. I don't love his take on Catwoman, but his, his, oh, what is it? The way in which he actually writes her as a master thief is really clever, and I really like that. So we get a little bit of Batman Returns feeling here as uh, Catwoman starts working um, via Penguin's plan and starts causing all this chaos in Lex's um, operations so that she can uh, get paid by Penguin and blah, 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 blah. And she just, uh, there's there's little moments and stuff like this. Like, Skin tight suit for a cat burglar actually makes some sense. You're more flexible. You're you're less likely to leave evidence behind stuff like that. But a tail and whiskers don't. So I really like this this line. Um, uh, I have my costume wrapped inside the towel. I borrow one of the whiskers to open the lock. Each wire whiskers a pick lock. That's why I added them to the outfit. I really like that. I don't like the way the artist, like, Cat, Catwoman's obviously a very sexualized character already. I don't like that the artist seems to be going out of his way to sexualize Catwoman literally at every turn. Um, just every other panel of Catwoman you see in here, she is just half naked or or the, the body is just being 
well too exaggerated for my taste. Uh, it's just, it's just superfluous. Um, but anyway, I like this, this general, like, heist master thief thing that the, uh, the writer has going on for her here, when she's breaking into LexCore and she finds these, like, power armors and is able to, um, reprogram them and steal them to leave the biggest, uh, biggest bite against Lex and, and all that stuff. That's really cool. And so she's able to use these super suits to steal a bunch of Luther's equipment. That's, I don't know, I really, really like that scene. Um, and then it comes back again, and she, you know, kind of betrays Penguin, and she, uh, she gets her, what she really wanted out of the whole thing, uh, which is revenge on Mercy. So she, she organizes a meetup with Lex Luthor that is going to be peaceful. Mercy is going to be there, but not be armed. And Lex says, what will it take to get you to stop messing with my operations? And she says, well, Lex, it's very simple. Lex, all you have to do is ask. Very well. I'm asking you to stop interfering with my business. Say, please. Please. Why, certainly, Lex. All you had to do was ask. I could never refuse anything. You know that. Ciao, Mercy, darling. Uh, and then Lex just, like, walks back to the limo and gets in the car and he says, I'm very disappointed, Mercy. Very. And you just get this, like, I love the sense that Mercy is just completely devoted to Lex Luthor. Uh, so that, like, the, the one thing... Catwoman had to do to get revenge on Mercy for literally shooting her in the gut was to to make Lex disappointed in her. Um, so that was really cool. And then I don't like the way this ends, but whatever. Um, then everyone gears up for a final confrontation with the Joker uh, on Christmas Eve, which is... You know, pretty cool. I like it. I like it quite a bit. Um, the Joker's plan is to kidnap every baby born in No Man's Land. Uh, his idea is to steal hope. Again, here's the imagery of the domestic violence occurring in the comic, and tonally, it's a lot darker and a lot harder to look at. Uh, so, fair warning on that. Yeah, just really the way Harley's written here. Choking me. S sorry, sorry, I'll be quiet. That's it, that's it. Like, it makes Joker an evil son of a bitch. It's just hard to look at. Um, but anyway, yes, Joker has kidnapped every baby in Gotham because he wants to steal hope. Uh, and that's, that's really good. I like that quite a bit. Um... Then the big reveal at the end is uh, Pettit's strongman gang get uh, prodded by Joker, and I really love the um, I really love the way this ends. Merry Christmas, pigs, and the start of the next issue, December twenty fourth, Christmas Eve. When Joker struck, he struck at the weakest link. Billy Pettit and his pseudo militia, the self proclaimed strongmen of Gotham City. Madness versus madness with innocence caught in the crossfire. Um, I should also mention that the name of this story is Endgame, and it is one of the better Joker stories in comics. So Joker uh, attacks the strongman and pokes and prods at Pettit, uh, who is clearly coming unhinged because he's a militiaman who was finally given the chance to run his own little military state, and now as that military state looks like it's going away because the federal government is coming back to Gotham City, he is becoming power hungry and power mad and, and you know, is, you know, pointing guns at people at every turn and not trusting anybody. Um, and that's causing a lot of a lot of grief with between him and Huntress. And so Joker's showing up and, and poking and prodding at him and daring him to come out and calling him a pig and all this stuff is really starting to to grind at him. Um, 
And so Pettit runs out and takes the bait and goes to attack Joker and sees him right in the sights of a sniper rifle and shoots him in the head. The Joker's been shot in the head by a random character who you've never heard of before No Man's Land, of course. Except it's not really the Joker. Because more Jokers start showing up. Turns out it's Pettit's men. Bill is killing his own men. Joker and Harley are kidnapping them and covering them in Joker clothes and makeup and sending them out. Uh, for Pettit to waste his bullets on and, and kill. Um, and that causes the uh, dynamic between Huntress and Pettit to erode completely to the point where Huntress tells... Um, what's his name? Flass? Whatever. Uh, tells one of the other militiamen to go to GCPD and get help. Uh, and as the guy starts to run away, he's like, hold off, I'll come with backup. And Bill Pettit says, I said, no one leaves without my permission, and shoots him in the head like he's a traitor. Huntress runs to the body and says, you, you're as mad as Joker is, as sick and as evil and as wrong. And she attacks and kills Pettit. Um... So what I really like about that scene is, as I said before, throughout the, the No Man's Land arc, we've been developing Huntress's character, and you know she's always been that, that anti-hero thing before. Anti-hero's a really big thing, by the way. Um, she's always been on that, that anti-hero line, and in No Man's Land, she's given the opportunity to go with someone who is, you know, by any means necessary kind of a character, who's willing to to kill um, and and do the wrong things for the right reasons. And she gets to be with that person and realizes it's not for the right reasons. It just happens to be somewhat better than people who want to kill because it's fun. Um, that it, it is about being power mad and is about letting things go to your head. And there's this recurring line throughout all of No Man's Land in regards to to Officer Pettit about how he has a bullet for every man, woman, and child in Gotham because he was crazy and he had a stockpile of ammunition before the cataclysm. Uh, and so Huntress is the only one left after she takes out Pettit and Joker sicks all of his men on her. Um... And she does a good job fighting them. And I really love this Joker line as he shoots her right in the middle of all the action. You're good. She's good, isn't she? Very good. As good as I've seen, and I've seen the best. It's funny because I wouldn't be shooting you like this. Except it turned out Pettit had so many bullets. I'd swear he had a bullet for every man, woman, and child in Gotham. And since I won't be using the bullets on the kids, I figure those ones... They're all yours. Here, have another one, cutie. Shoots her. Uh, tough little thing, ain't ya? Sigh. It's been fun. And just sticks the gun right up to her head. Uh, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, Joker finally made his move. Attacking Billy Pettit's camp, a battle of madmen. Pettit never had a chance. Huntress held her ground, fighting off 12 goons, taking three bullets, protecting the 80 innocent men, women, and children who have been ordered to attend Pettit's Christmas feast. She held her ground. We'll never forget that. You're a real sport doll, know that? Thanks for playing. And now we have a lovely parting gift for you. Bite me. Um, but just in time, Nightwing and Batman show up, so Joker rabbits. Uh... And it becomes a race to see what Joker's done with all the babies in Gotham. Um, and so the police and everybody are, are out looking for children, but all they're finding are booby traps. So we got Smilex gas, we got a bomb rig, yada, yada, yada. Um, Sarah Essen's walkie-talkie is damaged in all the uh, scramble 
And so Gordon tells her to go back to HQ to get another one. Uh, she does. Jo Batman's been chasing Joker the whole time, but notices Joker seems particularly acrobatic, which is strange. Um, and when he finally catches up, he realizes it's not Joker, it's Harley Quinn, and wants to know where Joker is. And she tells him that Central at HQ where Sarah is. And Sarah S. and Gordon walks in on the Joker with all the babies in no man's land. Uh, put the baby down gently now. And this has got to be one of the scariest fucking panels of the Joker ever. Just immediately, like, what I love about this panel is you get the sense that he knows exactly what he's about to do. The artist does such a good job of communicating the Joker as this horrific threat in just such little space. And I love the dialogue that Rucker writes for him. Oh, it's the police. Hmm. I'd like to report a crime. She tried to shoot me, and I dropped the baby. Stop it. I mean it. Reaches for his gun, starts pulled out. No, I mean she rushed me, and I dropped the baby. Or maybe I just throws the baby for Gordon to catch. Says Merry Christmas and shoots her in the head. The thing I like about this, and I, I I'll talk about the whole, you know, killing someone because it's Gordon, but um, because of their relation, Gordon, in a second. But the thing I like about this is he does it because it's so much more personal than the vague notion of killing someone of of killing someone who's who none of these characters know killing the baby of someone who none of these characters know i mean that's that is objectively awful killing babies is wrong um i, I don't know it's 2018 apparently we have to clarify these things um but what i really like about the scene is instead of killing the babies he kills the person who he knows he's going to have a direct personal effect on that he's going to have to continue to deal with. So he kills Sarah Eston Gordon. And I really, really like that. I really, truly do. And then the question becomes, well, he was still alone with the babies. Why didn't he kill her and the babies? And the answer becomes, I feel, it would show up the crime too much. Killing the babies would be the thing everyone remembers, not killing the police commissioner's wife. Um, now, there is arguably some sexism, some remnants of woman in the refrigerator, though this doesn't motivate Gordon. Um, this is, I feel this is really well treated like a tragedy. Maybe that's just me. Um, like, they, they don't mourn it. It doesn't give Gordon a new sense of purpose or anything. It's just a really sad fucking scene. Uh, and I really appreciate it for that. I don't know. Is she killed because it's going to have more of an effect on Gordon than it will on anyone? Yeah, I believe she'd been written in Gotham Central and, and had played a bigger role, though I could be wrong about that. Uh, she's definitely had a character throughout the entire series of No Man's Land. I felt like she's been an important character, a member of the, the GCPD gang. But there is definitely the the thing of it's done more to satisfy Gordon's character arc than it is to satisfy Gordon and Joker's characters than it is to satisfy her. I can't really deny that. I think it's well done, though. Um, maybe that's just me. I think that is an appropriate way in which to handle it. It's not exploitative. It doesn't just damage her um, for damaging her sake. It's not a shock value. Uh, I feel like this this has more implications than that. Um, so Gordon finds out about her being killed and um, wants to kill the Joker. And Batman straight says... I won't stop you this time. I can't. We've all gone too far. Look at them. Look at us. They can't take anymore. 
It's time to bring our people back, Jim. But I won't stop you. Um, and so Gordon decides to shoot Joker in the leg. Uh, he shot me! He shot my knee! I'm an ever... Oh! Like your daughter! I get it! Good one, Commissioner! And he's taken away laughing. Arrest him. Charge his murder. And Gordon just kind of like drops down to the ground and cries and Batman has to catch him. I really like that. That's a good scene. Um, I enjoyed it. Now let's talk about this this issue, which is The World Around the Corner. Uh, this is a Robin story. Now the last volume, volume three, ended with Tim Drake's father finding out that Robin, or that, that Tim Drake was in Gotham. Throughout this volume, Robin has been in Gotham still. Right at the end here, in this last issue, before the last issue of Endgame, they pick up the cliffhanger from the end of the last volume, and it's a story about extracting Tim Drake from Gotham. And it's like a big news event and everything. Why? Like, I, I think the story is, is pretty fucking pointless, um, just structurally. I think you either leave Goth uh, leave Robin in Gotham or you do not. Um, I think it's really, really stupid to have him be in and out, in and out. Because it takes away the severity of the No Man's Land when you do that. But then, again, at the same time, the way this is collected... Putting it here is the absolute worst place for it to be because it's in the middle of another story. It doesn't add anything to that other story, and it's just pointless. Um, like, I'm not going to say don't put it in, and obviously Robin spying on things is important and, and helping is important. I would say he should have... That should have been placed somewhere during the Catwoman Lex Luthor stuff. Um... And then just have him come back at some point where, I don't fucking know, but god, it was so, tr so weird to put it in the place they did. I really, really dislike it. You have no idea how weird it feels placed where it is. Um, because just, it interrupts the flow of the, um, the entire No Man's Land story so much, um. Yeah, it's just like, it's like they take him out of Gotham in his own book, but not in the other books. And that was just poor planning on whoever decided to do that Do that part. Um, that was just poorly thought out, and, and I don't like it. Uh, and it's weirdly placed in the collection, no matter what you do. It would have been awkward anywhere. It's really awkward there, because it stomps on a lot of the moments. Um, and then No Man's Land... And the end of Endgame happens as we attend the funeral of Sir S. and Gordon, and Lex Luthor makes his move with trying to buy up all of Gotham real estate th via fraud. Um, and so Batman has to kind of find a way to stop him, and yeah. Uh, it's just a cool story. I like it. It's, it's Batman versus versus Lex Luthor. It's great. Uh, I like I like how fucking ruthless Lex Luthor is. Here's this scene where Lucius Fox tells him, oh, I think you accidentally committed fraud. I'm gonna go, you can keep this, but I've got copies, and I'm gonna go down to the party and, and tell some other people about that. And Lex is like, oh, you don't mind if I keep these? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll look into it uh, shortly. And so Lucius Fox goes, okay, see you at the party, Lex, and leaves. And it's just, I love this, this sequence of panels. It's just single silent panel. As Lex, like, yells, Mercy, kill him before he gets downstairs! And she just rushes for the door. The Batman kicks it in and knocks her off her ass. Um, and then looks right at Luther and says, uh, I warned you a month ago, this is my town. <sighs> Gotham's not for sale. If you leave now, you can be in Metropolis by midnight because it happens on New Year's Eve. It's, it's a good scene. Um, and so on New Year's, Gotham is restored to the 
uh, status of a city is no longer no man's land, and that concludes no man's land. Uh, I had the most to say about this volume. I've been going for a while, I know. Normally, I don't uh, analyze it that uh, directly. But man, uh, do I love, love this volume. This is by far the best. Uh, again, Jurisprudence is the best Two-Face story for my money. Endgame, as a story arc, might be the best Joker Lex Luthor story. Uh, in a weird way, It's it's got a lot of... Um, you know, they're not working together directly. They're, in fact, working against each other at different points throughout the, the volume. But it's just really, really strong uh, characterizations of both of them, and I really appreciate that. And it's interesting to see how Batman has to deal with both of them. And so Lex Luthor's got this giant organized plan, and Joker's got this mad plan, and one of them does significantly more damage, and that's really, really cool. Um, but yeah, that'll do it. That will do it for this episode of Trade Talk. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the No Man's Land series. I've seen other people do in reviews of it, but nothing nearly this in-depth. Um, so, hope you enjoyed. Anyway, until next time, uh, I will catch you around. Bye. That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book.